right now for people out there that aren't familiar with the golf lab it's a 26,000 square foot game improvement center uh, just located on the north end of Toronto um, you know we provide basically every game improvement service all under one roof from uh, medical physical uh, golf technical annual coaching programs uh, full service equipment and then also, you know, membership for the golf and public to come in and practice and train in the same environment that we get to coach in. Cool, cool. Um, so, are you mainly uh, are you teaching there, or what's your role in all of this? Yeah, I mean, right now, uh, coaching is definitely a significant part of my role. Uh, I've I've uh, grown a men's team, men's amateur team over the past few years, as well as. Uh, look after our junior program, but also about 50% of my time over the course of the week is spent actually managing the different business activities. So there's uh, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, Mondays, uh, Monday, Tuesdays have evolved to become my days where I work on really moving the business forward and uh, creating, pursuing new opportunities. Uh, and then, you know, Wednesday is kind of my hands-on running the business day. So I uh, spend most of Wednesday in department meetings. Uh, I have two operating partners down there, so I spend a significant amount of time with them just reviewing what's happened in the past week and making sure that we're adapting as necessary to what we learn as we go and, uh, you know, that we're planning ahead to maximize uh, what's happening 90 to 120 days out. Uh, as soon as Thursday hits, uh, I'm rammed full teaching until the end of the day Saturday. And, uh, Sunday, try and recover and get up and do it all again Monday. <laughs> nice, nice. All right, yeah. so you've built a sustainable business that makes money if you're there or if you're not there, right? So this is what a lot of people are going for. So let's let's go back and, and reverse yeah. engineer this and, and see how you got here. So uh, where did it start for you? What was your, do you remember your first, like your first six months teaching? Like what were you doing? What was that like for you? Yeah, I mean, I uh, you know I, I started off as a as a club pro out uh, just east of Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, actually, uh, played in through the PAT in my last year of university, and learned very quickly that I much preferred the teaching and coaching to folding shirts and booking tea times because I really wasn't very good at that stuff. So, um, you know, I started off by running junior programs and doing some adult lessons. Uh, and then I had about a, an eight-year hiatus where I was uh, split in time between uh, World Long Drive Tour across North America, uh, playing mini tours in Southern California, and uh, a four-year stint over in Seoul, South Korea, playing around uh, South and Northeast Asia. So when I, uh, you know, when I realized that I wasn't going to be getting rich by playing golf, I uh, decided it was time to move back to Canada and always knew I wanted to start a business. So I, I was really fortunate to get a chance to uh, to apprentice under uh, one of only a couple active master professionals in the PGA of Canada, Bruce McCarroll. And at the time he was running uh, a center called the Golf Institute of Bondhead. And it really was the first integrated performance center where we had full-time medical staff, uh, of course the golf coaching and the equipment. You know, great practice facility, 400-yard long practice hole, 36-hole golf course. So, um, you know, that was the that was the first time I'd really taken, uh, you know, taking coaching seriously as a career. You know, I invested all of my time in that. And, uh, you know, the biggest thing that I, I really learned then was that, the you know, to me the major opportunity in the golf industry was to go well beyond the lesson model. You know, uh, a lot of the clients that we had were trying to piece together their own teams of coaches, a personal trainer, a chiropractor. They'd go to a place they perceived as an equipment fitting specialist, and then, of course, they'd have their, their golf pro, and none of them would talk to each other. Uh, you know, so I, I then got a, a job as a head professional at a resort just north of where I live in Barrie. Uh, and getting that was, it was an excellent opportunity. It was, uh, to be a head professional at the age of 28 uh, you know, was, a, was a great career move. It also forced my hand into opening the golf lab because I knew the resort was going to be shut down and I'm out of work in October. And uh, I had a pregnant wife at home and just bought a house. So I needed to find a way to make ends meet. Uh, 
and uh, I was able to sublet some space inside an executive squash and fitness club just around the corner from my house. So that, uh, you know, that fit in with, you know, my belief that addressing the physical component is one of the most important things that we as golf professionals can do to ensure the, the long-term improvement of our clientele. You know, I, I always felt from the beginning of my teaching career, if I could take a golfer, um, you know what, especially a lot of my clients, they, they didn't always used to listen to me very well. A lot of times they wouldn't practice the way I want them to practice, but if I had that, that same golfer who made minimal technical change and I was actually able to get them to become a little bit stronger, a little bit faster, have a little bit better balance, they became a better golfer, and at the end of the day, that's what they were paying me for. So, um, you know, it was critical to me to, to start my first operation where I had that fitness component access. Uh, on the business side of things, it also made it uh, made it very easy for me to get my uh, initial influx of clients. You know, within 13 days of opening the facility, we had 125 people that were paying $60 a month to come in and hit balls on our two flight scopes with video cameras. So it was uh, it was standalone. Uh, it would open and close with the gym, and it gave me the opportunity to hire uh, to hire a teaching professional very early on. That's awesome. So, I mean, where did you where did you get the idea for this? Like, what year was this, and and how did you get inspiration to this to was, launch that model? Uh, let's see. This would have been uh, this would have been about summer of two thousand nine when okay. I first started negotiations on the lease with uh, with the fitness center. Um, you know, I guess it was a combination of two things. Uh, the first, you know, which I, I now understand looking back, if I was ever to invest in someone, one of the most important <laughs> things you can look for in someone you're going to invest in is uh, making sure they don't have the opportunity to fail. You know, so as I look back out of a, out of a sheer matter of necessity, I had no choice but to succeed you know and uh, anyone who's had kids and gone through that I'm sure knows exactly what I'm talking about um, you know and the other piece was that it always just it, it always baffled me that um, as soon as the lesson was over it seemed to me like you know the, the teaching professionals were I guess unwilling to share their tools to help facilitate more rapid development you know I, I could never understand why when we finished a session at Bondhead, we we took the track man down and we we went and put the track man back in the closet. You know, why wouldn't we create a product that allowed the track man to generate revenue for us while we could be off teaching the next lesson? Um, so really, I guess putting those two, you know, those those two factors together, um, yeah, the golf lab came about. What was the price point that you that first that first launch that you did for for membership for that? That first one was sixty dollars a month. Now, uh, it, you know, people should also know that the members of the fitness club were already paying eighty dollars a month for access to both uh, the fitness center, the squash court, the executive locker room. Uh, so it was, you know, in, in my town here of Barrie, it's one of the, uh, you know, like it's one of the higher end, nicer fitness clubs. Okay, gotcha. And what was? How did you position it? Like, what was the? How did you sell it to people? Why they should do that? Well, you know, there there was a lot of golf traffic in there already, and you know, and like I said, a lot of a lot of our clients' motivation to even go to the gym, they know they need to do it for their personal health and fitness. But what gets them there is the thought of shooting lower scores. Yeah. So it really, you know, the thought for these people to finally have the opportunity to connect their, you know, their passion for golf and their you know, I guess their their need or perceived need to address the physical aspect to you know slow down the aging process or hit the ball farther, whatever their motivation was, they gravitated towards it right away. Huh. Interesting. So, how would you replicate this? Let's say somebody has a track man. They're in the Midwest. They're uh, yeah. they're in the northern states. They've got a winter period. Uh, they're going to teach some, but obviously not full. How do they set up the situation where they can create this membership type program to leverage their tool? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, the the biggest thing I think at the start is really, I guess, the two biggest pieces of advice I give to an independent teaching professional is to, um, you know, but before you before you even go and approach a potential facility with a partnership opportunity, make sure you clearly understand how it's a win for them, uh, you know, and then also find a way to do it in a as much of an overhead controlled environment as possible. 
you know, so I'd recommend what I first started off with was uh, I wasn't paying any rent. It was a revenue share on the membership model. So it, it provided them with a, an ancillary revenue stream for space that wasn't, wasn't otherwise being used. That's awesome. And what was kind of, what was the conversion rate? So, I mean, if, if you're going into a place that has, uh, you know, some members, let's say 100 members, um, and you're going to launch this, how many people could you expect to convert into well, something it was, like that? Well, uh, it was just under 20% in this okay. particular facility. So you know, it, it did have an active membership, a, a good chunk of it. One of the things I found was actually 50% uh, of, my, uh, of my membership to that uh, initial little golf lab uh, were actually the squash players. You know, and I think, uh, I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that I was actively engaged in that squash community. So, um, you know, I, I think one of the things, if you're, you know, if you're a golf professional in the Midwest and you're trying to get a setup like this in your hometown, one of the most important things you can do is plug yourself into the community. Because, you know, if you haven't already, as you get to know people and form relationships, um, people are going to want to, you know, they're already spending the money on these services, you know, so they're, maybe they'll relocate from the golf dome in town under your roof just because they like you. Yeah. No, I like that you're leveraging this this resource and creating a win-win. Like nobody's losing um, in that situation. So, when did you know it was right to have your own facility to to go out and and take that leap? Um, well, <laughs> I, I I guess I never did. You know, I, <laughs> but I I think you know one of the you know I guess one of the things. Uh, you know, one of the, the messages I hope that maybe people can take from me and integrate into their own businesses is that you're never, you're never really going to know. Uh, but, you know, one of the most important things to be successful is going to be the willingness to take risks and follow through on things you're unsure of. You know, you make a million mistakes along the way, but um, if you don't try, you'll never know. You know, so I mean, uh, shortly after we opened, I had three different groups of investors, uh, you know, that approached me that were intrigued with, how many revenue streams we had going on in such a small footprint. Um, you know, so after a bunch of discussions and for various reasons, primarily the fact that, you know, the one individual had been through a startup uh, process before a startup organization, uh, you know, I made a decision to partner with, uh, with, I guess at the time it was two individuals. And, um, you know, we set some goals. Uh, their biggest question obviously was, um, two things, I guess, is number one, uh, how do I know this is a real business and not just an ambitious golf professional, which is, uh, you know, still a question that I, I probably ask myself every time I'm going to make a business related decision. You know, is it, uh, is this something that is eventually repeatable? Um, you know, and then, uh, you know, I guess the other thing was we, we set a metric uh, to find out could this generate a net profit 12 months a year when it's summertime in Canada and everybody goes outside and you know, nobody wants to take anything inside in the summertime up here and I don't blame you. I'd rather be outside as well <laughs> so um, we developed a, a software product as a means to generate revenue during the summer when people wouldn't be inside and after after a full 12 months as partners we hit the financial targets that were set out we turned a net profit uh, and then the capital from our original agreement was committed to open a major center. So, so you spent those 12 months still in that facility um, working on those goals, is that right? Yeah, so okay. we, we had the 1,000 square feet at the, uh, at the Squash and Fitness Center here in Barrie. Meantime, that summer, I was, uh, I was still the head golf professional at Taboo Resort, which is uh, about 65 miles north of where I live. And we landed a software contract at a property called Angus Glen, which is about another 60 miles south of where I live. So my day consisted of getting up early in the morning, driving up north to the day job. Uh, I was able to get out of there about 2 o'clock most days, uh, get down to oversee the software project, make sure it was going properly. I'd usually get there. It was about a two-hour commute, so I'd get there at 4 p.m., spend some time there and get home around 7 p.m. and do it all again the next day. 
Wow, that's crazy. Oh, yeah. You mentioned something that you had these revenue streams. What, just to clarify, what are the different revenue streams? that? Uh, well, we had membership, which was our biggest contributor to general overhead. And, of course, uh, there was the teaching and coaching that I was doing. Uh, we got our first fitting cart from Titleist, so we were able to start to do some new product sales. And then even putting in a uh, you know, simple Lyloff machine and uh, gripping station, we were able to do club repairs. Awesome. Cool. Okay, so the 12 months go by, you hit your goals, which is amazing. Um, what what then? Well, then, uh, you know, the capital was committed to open a major center. Uh, I spent a significant amount of time, obviously, working on a business model and was very fortunate. Um, up here, we have these uh, government-funded accelerator centers. So there was a new one opening in Barrie, and I was the first person approached to approach uh, to be a part of it. And... They're, they're put together in order to help facilitate young entrepreneurs and give them access to professional expertise that they wouldn't otherwise have. So I was able to work with branding experts in terms of coming up with the logo. Um, I, had a, I had a project planning expert that put together a game plan, uh, which was very detailed for actually opening the facility on time once the building had been selected. So, uh, you know, I spent most of my days in heavy, heavy planning, uh, going down, you know, the facility we're at now, I think I looked at every single building on the street. We had a demographic analyst that, uh, you know, really just narrowed it down to two small pockets uh, in Toronto, just based on, um, you know, based on cost per square foot of buildings, accessibility to major highways, uh, proximity to private golf clubs, income demographics within the area. So, um, a lot of planning. <laughs> hmm. yeah. Just a random tangent. If you were, let's say, moving to a new city or you gonna you were gonna do something different, would you go down and do that kind of analysis of of your new place again? Oh yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. I think uh, I think one of the the best decisions that we made was selecting the geographic area that we're in. You know, for um, well, I guess for anyone out there, if they wanted to go to Google Maps and take a look at a map of Toronto, we're, uh, we're right near the intersection of two of our major highways, 400 and 407, which, uh, you know, it puts nearly 4 million people within a 40-minute drive of our center. Hmm. And do you know, like, uh, the majority of your members or your students, are the majority of them within 10 minutes of you, or is it all spread out? The majority of the members live within 20 minutes. We okay. found that people will travel about twice that for professional services, so they'll willing to travel 40, 45 minutes for a golf lesson without uh, without too much of an effort. And then actually what we've noticed is for club fitting, uh, people are willing to travel, uh, I guess, even farther. You know, and I think a lot of that, um, I think there's a pretty strong inverse correlation between the frequency with, with which people subscribe to these uh, uh, engagements, I guess you'd say, mm -hmm. and how far they're willing to travel. So if it's someone who's going to be a regular user, like a member, they're not willing to travel particularly far. If they're going to buy a set of golf clubs that they expect to get five years out of, they're willing to cover a significant amount of distance. That's that's really interesting. That's cool. Okay, so you're at you're selecting the location. You, you picked your spot. Um, what were some of the next steps here going down? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of sleepless nights. <laughs> You know, I mean, the you know, the, I guess one of the biggest things when I when I talk to people about the business and starting their own is really about controlled overhead. You know, and um, the original business model called for between twelve and fourteen thousand square feet, uh, and the decision was made to go with twenty six thousand square feet, which, uh, yeah, you know, immediately just scared the crap out of me to be quite honest because you know you're going from 900 square feet in a one person operation to 26,000 square feet that's an empty warehouse with no members <laughs> so uh, step one was sleepless nights I remember uh, <laughs> I remember a few days after we got the keys I was I was sitting in the office with, with my former partner and I said to him I said, you know what uh, I've got a problem he's like what's the problem I said I've been sitting here for three days and I can't spend any money. I'm freaked out because <laughs> I, you know, I was uh, I was in the process of purchasing eight flight scopes and I'm just looking at this, you know, looking at a bill for a couple hundred grand, going, "Oh my God, this is more than my house is worth." Wow. Um, you know, so yeah, it was a really interesting conversation. One I still, 
still think about a lot when I'm again when I'm trying to make business decisions. But uh, he talked about the difference between spending and investing. You know, and so you know, well, what you're not actually going to be spending anything. You're investing. You know, without the, without the tools that you're that you need to invest in, you're not going to have the opportunity to make the revenue back. So you know, then we kind of I kicked it into gear, I guess, on my end, and uh, you know, we had a great team of people and contractors to put the place together. So we were able to get the doors open in 54 days. Wow. And, uh, yeah, over the past uh, over the past. I guess a year, well, 14, 14 months leading up to that, we'd been aggressively building a database of golfers in Toronto. So, you know, through communicating with that database, we were, we were pretty excited when we got uh, 250 people to show up to our grand opening day with, uh, with zero marketing dollars spent. So that wow. was all through uh, email campaigns through the database that we built. How did you build the database? Uh, it was through the uh, software product that we built. It was uh, it integrated with launch monitors, and so we started uh, we started an arm of the business that hosted corporate events. So instead of having that longest drive contest with the stick in the ground, we had a launch monitor and an operator on the tee, where people could hit their drive in the longest drive hole, and we would collect their information and in real time send them an email of their actual shot. And then at the end of the day, I would send out a second email. Said, "Oh, this person won the longest drive. Here's the average drive of the day. Here's where you rank." So just some neat user engagement stuff. That's uh, amazing. I haven't yeah, heard of that idea before. Why not? <laughs> Why uh, isn't that more widespread? I, I again, I don't know. I, I again, I, I guess I think it probably just it, it probably just came to me through those days at Bondhead, where I was looking at a busy tournament golf course with 36 holes. Again, just taking this thirty thousand dollar piece of equipment, the TrackMan, and having it sit inside a closet. Yeah. You know? Okay. How many ways are there to use the TrackMan to make money <laughs> instead of putting it in a closet? What are? Do you have any other ideas? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I mean, obviously, uh, obviously, it's it. Well, first, you just want to make sure that you're generating as many dollars as you can per hour with it. Um, so there's, you know, there's membership, you know, which is what we do where you sell not quite but close to an unlimited amount of time. You know, there's, uh, you know, one of the things we do in our training programs that are offered to non-members is bundled in with that. There's practice hours on TrackMan, so they're paying for them whether they use them or not. Um, there's the, you know, if you're at a, at a green grass facility, particularly if you're trying to build your clientele base, get it out on the tee box as much as possible. You know, if it's a public place, get it out there every Saturday morning. You know, even if you have to hire one of the backshop kids in off time while you're teaching lessons on the tee, you know, you can use it to build exposure, build a database, provide unique experiences. You know, um, we surveyed uh, we surveyed our database, uh, which is, it's an active of about 17,000 people now. And, you know, it's amazing because over 80% of them still have never hit on a launch monitor. So, you know, I think just using it to attract new clientele that way is uh, is a no-brainer, really. Is it a big selling point? I mean, are you able to, is that a, a piece of the puzzle or when you ask people why they, they purchased whatever, is having that ability to get in the launch monitor something they say? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I mean, uh, we routinely get people coming in and say, oh, yeah, I met you guys at a tournament or... You know, I hit my shot over here, did this. So it's a, it's an exposure thing, and immediately they associate your brand with something that is cutting edge. You know, it's uh, it's not that they, you know, they come in and they're a lay-down sale into a long-term program, but they come in with a brand awareness that, you know, you've got technology and you're in the game improvement world. You know, so they come in open-minded and, you know, with uh, with the mass media communications that are out there right now, People are actively seeking quantifiable feedback. You know, you look at whether it's wearable technology. Um, you see, is you know, club attachment technology, personal launch monitors. Uh, you know, golf instruction is going the way. Uh, you know, I'd say personal training did 20 years ago, where it's all about quantifiable results. Yeah. For sure. So uh, this might be an interesting question. For somebody that purchases a TrackMan, if they utilize it to the most that they can, how long do you think it should take them to um, 
pay off that that cost, right? I mean, it, when you've seen, you've you've purchased a lot of equipment here. If someone is going to utilize it to the best of their ability, can they can they pay that that entire chunk off in a year, in nine months? What do you what do you think is possible? Well, I mean, it, you know, depending on your environment, yeah, it can be paid off very quickly. You know, there's such a broad, diverse of setups uh, that we have. You know, from independent contractors at golf courses to people at private clubs. Um, you know, the the ratio that I always talk to independent instructors looking about making their own investment is that they should they should be investing 5% of their gross income into technology and should have a five-year amortization period built in for any new investment. So, you know, 5% times five years. So I always use the analogy, if you're making $100,000 a year teaching lessons, uh, you know, 5% is five grand, five years is 25 grand, so go buy your TrackMan. Uh, if you're an assistant pro looking to try and build your business, don't buy a TrackMan and expect it to build your business for you. If you're doing $10,000 a year, you do the math and you should be finding something in about the $2,500 range uh, you know, that's going to allow you to enhance your service and provide quantifiable feedback. Um, you know, so whether it be an entry-level launch monitor, something like an ES-12, ES-14, maybe pair it with, uh, with a body track or a high-speed camera, Something that's going to provide your students, um, you know, a quality communication tool. Something that fits your teaching style, and yeah, something you can get your money back out of. I love it. Okay, so five percent on on tools. Do you have yeah. any other kind of rules that, like, what about education or some other things like that? What do you What do you think? Where should they be? Yeah, well, you know, I always, I think that you should be taking twenty percent of your gross income and reinvesting in yourself. You know, so I, I, again, I'm going to say that that, depending on depending on your skill set, you're going to want to apply that slightly differently. You know, so um, let's say some people that have a, someone has a more formal education background in the human body or biomechanics. The education piece may be a, a less relevant investment, but they may need some real support on marketing skills and development. You know, in which case it would be about hiring a you know, hiring a, a website design person or search engine optimization, uh, you know, obviously is a big one. I think that's one thing our industry still lags significantly behind in. Um, so it's really, I guess it's really about doing an audit of your skill set and understanding where your weaknesses are and then making the appropriate investments to have professionals work for you so you can stick to your core competencies. And when you, this is an interesting conversation, when you say 20% or 5%, are you talking about total revenues or are you talking about profit? Uh, I'd be talking about them more as a gross revenue from an individual structure and standpoint. Okay. Um, you know, when you, if, like if you take a look at from more of a, more of a, a traditional business point of view, I'd say about 6% is a normal ratio to be spending on your marketing budget every year. Uh, you know, so if you're, if people out there, um, I guess, in a more formal business structure as opposed to, you know, the independent contractor, maybe with subcontractors underneath you, those uh, those ratios can change and it can change based on the, the type of overhead that you have and the seasonality of your business. Gotcha. Uh, you know, what about an independent contractor? Let's just say 100 grand because it's easy. Um, could you break it down? Break down that 100 grand. Where do you see his profit? Where do you see the other... Uh, the other percentage is going. Well, I mean, uh, I'd say, well, if, if 100 grand is your gross revenue, you're probably going to have some sort of an overhead for your facility. So you see, that's 20 percent. Um, I would base the percentages I'm talking about off the 80 grand that you actually retain for your time investment. You know, the 20 percent that's your overhead, that's gone. So if you're if you're retaining, um, you know, I guess it'd be 80 thousand dollars would be your gross margin. You know, and so you'd want to take five percent of your gross margin per year and, and have that allocated towards technology. You know, and that's not that you have to spend five percent every year, but I think it's just it, it's just it's a formula that's kind of held together when I've talked to a lot of different teaching professionals at a lot of different scales of business, trying to figure out where they need to make their investments to stay current in the industry, which is you know I think. Uh, particularly now things are moving so fast a lot of the questions I get are from people that have good businesses but you know they're uh, they're apprehensive about getting passed by as new technology emerges hmm okay so we've got four grand on um, 
technology. That's five percent of, of eighty grand. What and else six, do we have? Uh, six is a six percent is a, is a pretty standard marketing budget. Okay, so let's see. We've got six percent, so we've got forty eight hundred. So we've yep. got eighty eight hundred dollars there that's gone for those. Yeah, and then um, I would be taking five percent specifically towards uh, you know professional development and education. So another four grand. All yeah. right. Anything else here that you got? Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that I've done, and this, you know, maybe this falls under the professional education piece, but uh, I always have a budget every single year for bringing guest coaches and guest speakers. You know, we're very fortunate since the first day we opened the lab. We've had, uh, gosh, let me try and go through the list here. Um, I'd, We've had Mike Shannon, we've had Gary Wyron, we've had Carl Morris, um, we've had uh, we've had Jason Glass, we've had Derek Ingram who coaches uh, Team Canada men's program up here. We've had Tristan Mullally who does the women's national team program. Um, those are the first ones that come to mind. Uh, we've had Henry Brunton come in and speak with our members. Uh, we've had various other physical and medical professionals, but. Um, I think that's a huge, uh, a huge factor in client retention. You know, is to is to invest in, in the education of your client base. You know, when it when it when those seminars are done, they always drive a significant amount of sales. And the more you can educate your clientele as to why they still need your services, the longer they'll stay with you. Very cool. So, what would it, would we allocate toward toward something like that? Do you think? Yeah, about four percent. Four percent. Yeah. Okay. This math is getting to be complicated here. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so we're somewhere around like sixty sixty three grand in that neighborhood, right? Is what we have left, and then obviously there's taxes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that would be kind of an allocation that you think would be worthwhile for, for somebody to, to think about as they're budgeting for this this year, maybe next year now? Well, you know, I, I think that if you're, um, well, you know what, I was, uh, I, was in a, I was in a meeting this morning and a, a, a quote comes to mind and I'm, you know, it's funny, it's a, I, I really believe this, I, th I think your best investment is yourself. Um, and uh, the question was asked to Alan Greenspan a few years ago about what's the best investment, and he responded the same way and said, you know, the best investment is yourself, and it's for two reasons. Number one, you can control the input, and number two, you can measure the output. So if you're serious about growing beyond that $80,000 in gross revenue, the best way for it to happen is to invest in yourself. So if you give yourself stronger education, professional support, high-end tools and invest in your customer experience, you can sustainably go through rapid growth in your, uh, you know, gross revenue. What What are for you a couple investments in yourself that you've seen the, the biggest results from? Uh, good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, for me, I think it's, uh, you know, education. The, the education, various professional education certification programs I've gone through, you know, I'll say the, the, the title, the certification itself um, isn't the ROI. The ROI is in uh, acquiring the knowledge that allows you to, to integrate programs at a higher level, you know, be it off-season, on-season programs, physical and technical programs, um, you know, so that's, that professional education has allowed me to continue moving forward and develop more effective programs. Um, the other one, uh, you know, I guess as a single one-time investment was uh, was my Aimpoint certification a few years ago. Uh, at the time, I just I saw an opportunity for something that was on the fringe, I'll say, but it uh, it, it really fit with the things that I'm attracted to. The fact that it was a scientifically quantifiable system, um, and there was no other aim point instructors at the time between Montreal and Winnipeg. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, I believe it's still that way. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, you know, that gave me access to provide a very unique experience to 
you know, about 11 million Canadians in that corridor. So the uh, it really gave me the ability to stand out and do something that nobody else was doing. Gotcha. Awesome, uh, man. This has been this has been amazing. We'll have to we'll have to do a, another another chat with you sometime down the line here. But I guess to kind of to wrap this up, what do you see? Where is this headed now? Like, what are the the biggest opportunities, and what are some of the things that you see uh, as the most beneficial to that independent instructor, to the guy with with a couple contractors under him? What things are you most excited about that that people should look into? Well, you know, I, I think the the most broad spanning advice I could try and give anybody would be, um, you know, to uh, to try and make sure that you're always innovating and uh, and executing. You know, I think uh, you know going from employee to independent contractor now to business owner, I'd say the 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 biggest thing that I see lacking in what I'll call the average employee is the ability to execute. And there, there's a lot of people out there that have great ideas, but there's only a fraction of the population that actually takes an idea uh, from concept through to planning to actualization and sees it through from start to end. So, um, um, you know, that that's the rarest skill that I see in the golf industry. And, um, you know, to avoid the fear of failure because it doesn't, you know, the other thing I've learned is it doesn't have to be perfect. And you're going to make a lot more bad decisions than you are good ones. But if you make a few good ones along the way and you're adaptable and, uh, and not afraid of working your butt off, then, uh, then yeah, you, can, you get through all the bad ones you learn from and only get stronger because of it. Amazing. I, I totally agree with, with both of those things for sure. Uh, if people want to reach out to you if they have a question or they want to check out what you're doing. What's the best way that? Can... Uh, yeah, you can, uh, and they can email me, Liam at thegolflab.ca. They can go check out our webpage, uh, www.thegolflab.ca, and they can check out my personal page, which is mucklogolf.com. Very cool. Thanks, Liam. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Corey.